I'm here with Dorothy Stanley. Welcome. Thank you. And you play for Alain Schneider. I do. Uh, what's it like to perform at Arena Stage and work with Molly Smith? Well, do we have three days to talk about it? Um, I cannot extol Molly's virtues enough. Um, I, I am so thrilled to be working with her. She's such a positive, positive force and everything about her it just makes one happy 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 to be here um they say it starts at the top and it does uh she's i know she's a, a fairly recent artistic director but i just watch the way this whole mach I, I call it a well-oiled machine everybody here is so gracious and so kind and every time you turn the corner there's somebody willing to help you in any way shape or form and uh Molly, I'm very, very happy to be able to work with Molly, who is our, the artistic director as well. Um, auditioning for her was, was a lot of fun. We may be talking about an audition process later. Well, we can talk now, and you can tell us what you say at the audition. Well, I, uh, Eli, Eli, actually, the casting director, didn't know me very well, and my agent made a call. I said, I see the correct cabaret, that they're going to be doing cabaret at Arena. I want to audition for this production because I had material that I wanted to try out from Harold and Maude. A friend of mine had written the musical along with Tom Jones of the Fantastics fame. I saw that paper mill. Yes, you, oh, and, you did. And I loved it. I well, loved it. I sang a song of, of Maude's for this audition. Which I did, one was it? I did the, um, the demo, the original demo with Gavin Creel from, from, from Thoroughly Modern Mill. There you go. And uh, there was a song that I just, I, I needed to sing for because it was so much. You want to sing a little bit? Like, Give it some PR here? Well, it, without the music, I mean, it's yeah. a very um, haunting melody. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it goes something like, um, deep, deep down inside, uh, where, where no one else can see, I keep one tiny room that is only for me. There, sheltered from care, I keep my family. They're all alive, just as they used to be. All their faces are shining so bright. There, um, there's no sign of the nightmare outside us. So it, the, the point being that this is a, a survivor from the camps and she's lost her entire family. And the melody is just gorgeous. I, I'm not doing any justice to it now because I don't have it with me. But at the end of it, Molly said, do you have anything a little bit more cheerful? And I said, yes, I do. So I pulled out a Pete Seeger song that talks about its, its age. I think the chorus goes something like, how do I know my youth is all spent? My get up and go has got up and went. In spite of it all, I'm eager to grin when I think of the places my get up has been. That's and a Weaver song. Uh, he sang it when he was with the Weavers. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, then it, and Lee Hayes wrote it with him. There you go. There you go. I'm a big Weavers fan, everybody. <laughs> but it, it, it cheered her up, and we had a good laugh. And she then she asked me what was it that interested me about doing this role. And I had said, besides the fact that I love the show, I've seen the movie, I've worked with Liza Minnelli, I've worked with Joel Grey, I've been a Kit Kat girl, I've played for Cost, Cost, and now I if I... If I can just audition for Fraulein Schneider, I'd be thrilled because then I get to read. But read this the script. You want to try audition. for the MC in next production? <laughs> done everything else. I just might. The way things are going. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, she, I just said she's she's a survivor. I I, I did the tour, the post Broadway tour with Joel Gray and Marsha Lewis played Fraulein Schneider, and we did the tour for eight months, and I just loved that role. I said, I want to grow up and do that role. She is um, like, she's the, um, the ballast. She's the, the she's the, I want to say the calmness of the show. Uh, that's probably not a good word, but uh, she's almost the heart, the heart of it. Her, the relationship between she and, and Herr Schultz, which is <laughs> that's heart wrenching, right. but um, she is a survivor. She's the one who's lived through it all. Uh, a person of her age would have been born in the late 1800s and would have seen some very good times. And she would have been she would have been more affluent when she was younger, grown up in a very in a decent situation in Germany. But unfortunately, she's she she never got married. So I'm thinking. I mean, she she may have even been a, a performer in her own right, but not in a cabaret. I think she was a 
a classy, a classy dame. But now she's been through hard times, she's seeing what's happened, and in a nutshell, um, she has to stay, and she's been through wars, she's been, she's been through revolutions, as the, as the script is so beautifully written. You, you, she wears her heart on her sleeve in this, in this show. And she's been through it all. She's been there, gotten the t-shirt, and um, she has to s stay where she is in order to survive. And unfortunately, the relationship pays for it. Let's yeah. talk about Walter Charles. Because oh. we interviewed him yesterday. My dream. He is, you know, I'm one of his biggest fans. <laughs> I'm I, sure you are. And <laughs> I brought a whole stack of things yesterday for the man to sign. And I think I've seen him in everything except for Hello Dolly and <laughs> Paper Mill. I God missed that bless one. You. Yeah. I know. Well, he feels the same way. But anyways, uh, and I told him, and I'll tell you too, that uh, the pineapple song, that moment is the, the heart of the show, I think. It's sweet, isn't and it? And it's so sweet and tender. And so that leads you into, if you could sing a little bit of the pineapple oh, song. Oh, sure, it. sure. I'd be happy to. If you bought me diamonds, if you bought me pearls, if you bought me roses like some other gents might bring to other girls, it couldn't please me more than the gift I see. A pineapple for me. And of course he sings. That incredible da, voice da, I have. Da, 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 I can hear Hawaiian breezes blow. Oh yes, when he opens his mouth, you just melt. I have to tell you a cute story when, when we, um, during the audition, I saw there was a piece of paper that you sign outside the room, and you see people's names who have auditioned before you. And I saw Walter's name, and when I walked in the room, I just smiled, and I said to Molly, Molly, I'm, Molly hello, it's nice to meet you. I'm smiling because I just saw Walter Charles's name, and we go back, and I winked at her, like, mm-hmm, because we had worked together years ago in a, in a night music where he played Frederick and I played Charlotte, but we became good friends and we've not worked together since, but we know each other certainly socially and have seen each other at, at functions. And it's just, uh, it's just so divine. And when I saw, when we saw each other at the callbacks the next day, it was like, oh, goody, <laughs> we got to read together. I must say he said such wonderful things about you too. Oh, he, well. He loves working with you. The, the feeling is mutual. Well, how difficult is to, is it to play that scene where you tell him, Herr Schultz, that you can't marry him? It's such a heartbreaking scene. It and, is. You know, what's the audience reaction? Because I saw so many different reactions in the audience when you were uh, telling him that. I saw some anger, and I felt I saw some sympathy. So, what are you seeing? Well, you know, I I see. Well, I see Walter because uh, we're we're in the spotlight and we're we're on the stage and everybody's in either in darkness or behind us or above us. So I don't see people's reactions. Uh, there was an odd reaction last night because at one point he says, I turn around, he says, are, are we too old for words like love? And I say, far too old. I am no Juliet, you are no Romeo, we must be sensible. He said, then be sensible. How many meals have you eaten alone? 1,000, 2,000, I say 20,000. And a woman laughed, I think out of just nervousness. And, and that's the first time that's ever happened. But maybe, you know, it could have been my delivery. It's just really odd because as you know, every audience is different. I imagine there are people who are sad because they like us and they don't want us to break up. But there are people who are angry because how dare she break up with him? What, what is wrong with her that she would break up with him? And if they're listening, they'll, they'll I mean, it's hard for me to say that, you know, to, to, to say, I, I, I can't marry you because the Nazis are coming and you're in trouble and you, you know, you're going to, you're going to go off to the camp. I mean, I can't, I don't know that future, but I need to stay where I'm secure and I can't do that if we get married. Uh, and he has no clue. No. That's the yeah. saddest part. That's why I was wiping the tear away. The poor guy just doesn't get it. Well, no, because he, he even in his scene, his goodbye scene to Cliff, he, he, he thinks everything's just going to be fine. I, I am a German and there's, there's, you know, everything's going to be just fine. No. <laughs> so. For everybody has a story, uh, you know, being a Jew myself, of families, uh, family members who just didn't believe it and who then mm -hmm. perished. Mm -hmm. So. It's a, it's a denial. It's a kind of denial. They didn't want to see what was coming. I think uh, me too, but um, I, my friend Ernst, who is a Nazi, and I mean those people in the party, they are my neighbors. Maybe not my friends because of course Sally's invited them all, and they're all crazy, and we love them all. But um, 
They are indeed my friends and my, my neighbors. So and they're, it makes you feel safe. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Sure. So you said you played Fraulein Klost in, in the... Uh, Post-Broadway tour. Post -Broadway yes. with, uh, with, with Joel Gray. I did. So uh, do you did you play that role similarly or different than the great Sherry Edelin? Who well, you know, Molly is just so great. And Sherry is she, Sherry is a consummate actress. She's a comedian. She's she's just brilliant. I have... Um, I can't extol enough virtues uh, for her. But uh, she has added this layer of being... Um, drunk and you know drinking a lot which is, is adorable and it works beautifully i wish i had thought of it but i bet you uh you know how prince would not have have allowed it he actually took um joel blum's being drunk in showboat out of a, of, of a scene that he was supposed to, it says in the scene he comes in drunk but there was something about being inebriated and he just didn't he he would not probably have let that fly. Maybe because it's so overdone sometimes and takes well, away maybe, from the story. But, I mean, Sherry has it down. She's, <laughs> she's got all the nuances, but she's not, it's not like you're watching a, a, a just, you know, a regular drunk. I mean, she's just, she's flowered it and it put layers on it that are just brilliant. But no, I was a classy whore. I used to see my clothes. You should have seen my clothes in the Broadway show. I mean, they were just phenomenal. And I had a beautiful robe and a beautiful corset and bustier. And, and also, it just wasn't that racy, you know, it wasn't as racy and as raw as, as this It was production. a different time, and so most Broadway musicals, sure. even if they were political, they had to gear it towards families. That's right, that's, that's right. That's where their audience was. Well, and this was, you know, this was, of course, a, a tour in the Midwest and all over, and, you know, we had to be careful. But how it was a very safe and good looking and beautiful show um and joel gray was was was, was great um the Fraulein schneider was tremendous who was it it was uh marcia lewis who was in chicago marcia lewis yeah. who was in chicago yeah and and michael allenson played here schultz who was uh, rex harrison's understudy for years looked he even looked like him did he ever go on i wonder <laughs> I wish, yes, he did. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and we'll talk about your understanding okay. later. Right? Well, let's talk about coming from the worst pies in London. Ah. This great uh, production that John Doyle won the Tony yes, for, for yes. Best Director. And I saw it twice, and I was up there the last weekend when it closed because I had to go see it again. Because the first time I was there and took my group on a New York trip, we do that twice a year. Mm -hmm. We see five shows in a weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the second row, which was too scary for me. Did the Tobias get you with his... Did yes, he did. Of course. <laughs> of course. He, he played the audience. Manuel. 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 Yeah, he, he got me pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted to sit in the back of... More in the middle, towards the back on the aisle this time, so I could really absorb it. And get absorbed if you know what I mean or attacked mm -hmm. and uh, what a wonderful production uh, you were Patty LuPone's standby I was so can you explain to our listeners what a standby is what they do sure. and uh, how it's different from being an understudy sure we were uh, all standbys there there were no understudies because understudies usually have their own track in a show and go on for the person that they are covering. A standby is not in the show at all. We don't have to put on makeup, costumes. We don't appear on stage ever uh, unless that person is out. Um, and uh, then, of course, there are swings. But swings are people who go on for mainly a lot of people. That's probably why they're called swings. There was one, for instance, there was one girl who, who swung for 24 different chorus girls in 42nd Street when they first opened. Then they hired some extra girls. But anyway, we'll go back to Sweeney Todd. Originally, there were four of us, two older people um, and myself. And I mean, two, two older people. I was one of the older people. And Merwin Ford covered Michael Cerberus and the judge and Fogg. And I covered... Um, not only Patty, but Donald and Champlin, and Tobias on the violin, and Fogg on the on the synthesizer. Even though he played the string bass, and I say that we had un musical understudies because the score would never be compromised. So if someone were out, if one of the leads were out that did not play that instrument, one of us would play that instrument on the stage, but in in the back and not not in light, not in full light. Um, it was the most daunting show I've ever been cast in. Uh, it, it, it was a frightening because there were only four of us to cover ten roles until we opened. And once we opened, the stage manager showed the producers that there were 49 different 
combinations for which they'd have to cancel the show in case one or two of the people, the people were out. So uh, that never happened. It almost happened, but it didn't. And uh, we, we got three more covers. So that in understudy rehearsals, we at least had seven people plus the stage managers to do all 10 roles. But it was a joke at first because there were only four people to do 10 roles in understudy rehearsal. And it was very hard. I, it was also, I have to say, probably the most exciting uh, audition that I ever landed. I mean, I should say role that I ever landed, but the audition was, was quite something. I had to get, you know, Sondheim's approval at the end. But to get offered that job was probably mo more exciting than almost anything, except for the day that Hal Prince called me personally at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'd just gotten out of bed and he said, Hi, Dottie, this is Hal Prince. I just want you to know that I want you to play Ellie in Chobo. And I, I mean, I literally, I jumped and the, the, the phone went out of my hand and I'm going, oh my God. But uh, that doesn't happen very often. But um, it was just so exciting to get cast in Sweeney. And then this was, coming here, I actually was, I knew that I knew that Sweeney was coming to an end at some point. I, we didn't know when, like Labor Day, November, Thanksgiving, first of the year. And I saw this cabaret on the breakdowns and I said, you know what, I just want to audition for it. And when I got cast for it, I gave my notice to Sweeney. And, and a week later, I got a phone call from the company manager saying that Sweeney was going to close on Labor Day. So this was a really good move on my part. Just and good timing. Very good timing. And in many ways, Cabaret is a huge band-aid on that, that because um, I went on for, for Patty seven times, and the first couple times were grueling because um, I hadn't even been through the show, all the way through the show in the second act, and it was, it was a lot of hard work and focus. But, you know, the more you go on, the easier it gets, and I, the last time I went on was three times in a row. And I can only say that I have a shrine to Michael Cerberus in well, my you know, apartment. I love him. And He's phenomenal. The, the entire cast is phenomenal. And let me tell you, when I went on, they rallied around me and were so fantastic. They're, it was just an, a wonderful, wonderful experience, but too short-lived and very frustrating. Because as a standby, you don't get to, you never know when you're going to go on. Uh, it's a half hour's notice, uh, an hour if you're lucky. and. Um, there was one performance of the seven that I knew I was going to go on. And uh, so I invited all my friends and, and family and uh, 45 people came to see me. That, that, that must have know, been exciting. Everybody else was working or out of town, mm -hmm. but it was, it was very exciting and it went, it went very well. But um, Michael Service is, is mar marvelous and Patti Lapone was very, very sweet to me. I didn't cross paths with her a lot because she was always at the theater very early and I would come at half hour and then I would leave before the curtain came down because they, they allowed us to do that after so many months and then uh, she would leave. So I didn't see her very often but whenever I did she was always very nice and, and complimentary about something I was wearing or whatever. So she was very kind. So she's always been nice to me when we're waiting Good. at the stage door. Some people say she's tough. And there were a couple of times when she didn't sign, but it was raining. I don't blame her. Well, she didn't rest her voice. And she's always been nice to me in all the shows that I've seen her in. Uh, let's talk about, you know, it didn't win the Tony Award. It won all the other critic awards. And uh, at my Tony party, I, there was total silence. Our and jaws are still on the Our jaws are when, when it lost. I mean, I was so shocked. So how much of an effect do you think that had? I don't, you know, I, I don't really know. I know that they were losing, with losing Alexander Gemignani to Les Mis in the fall, and then my giving my notice, I'm telling you, it costs a lot of money to replace people. And they had seen, I think, everybody who had played, who played an instrument that was an actor. And not only finding people for, for Sweeney was tough, but then they were casting company. And they found that brilliant cast, but finding people to do these roles and stand by for them is really, really hard. And I don't think that us leaving was going to help much. I mean, I don't want to say that it was our fault that we were leaving. Uh, but I also, I can also tell you that box office wasn't great in August, and I guess it wasn't looking that great for September either, although both Patty and Michael had signed through November 29th. But um, I guess, it, and also, you know, after Labor Day, all, all the kids go back to school, and we had a lot of school groups come in and uh, and you know teenagers and young college people but they all go back to school so i think that it, i think that it was i guess a wise choice for them for the producers 
because they have company coming up anyway. <laughs> right, which I'm seeing November 12th. Good they, for they, you. Lucky me. I was online when they started selling those tickets. I think I might have been the first one hitting those keys. Oh, put me in your briefcase. We're I in the see fifth you. row dead center. I'm Good a happy man. Okay. And I love Raul <laughs> Esparza, so I'm very yes, happy. Yes, and I hear it's wonderful. I had, I had a lot of members go to Cincinnati. We made oh. trips just to see it and uh, uh -huh. coming to see it again. Well, let's talk about Sondheim because you've appeared in many of his productions, Into the Woods, I'm Company. Bowing. She's bowing, everybody. Bowing I've never seen anybody bow during, in my <laughs> podcast. But this is new. And uh, you did the revival of Follies in 2001 with a very interesting cast, yes. uh, Gregory Harrison and Blythe Danner, who you went on yes. for. Yes. Uh, and Treat Williams and Judy Ivey, who played the other the other couple. Funny story, um, Carnegie Mellon, which is where I, I went to school for music, uh, the, the drama department decided to do a show and, evolve, and combine the music and drama departments, and the show they decided to do was Follies. And I auditioned, and I got the role of Sally. And I loved the show so much. It was not, it was the first Sondheim show I'd ever done, and I, I went, why is this, I mean, the, the role is difficult, it's a huge role and she takes quite a, a journey, but why is it so easy and wonderful to play? It's because he writes for actors and you don't have to work. He's written it all out. The script is brilliant. The script was wonderful, but he, his songs, you go right from the written page to his song seamlessly and, it, and the song expands the story and then you come out of it seamlessly. And I just love doing Sondheim shows. Uh, besides, that was my first experience with Follies. Now, when Follies came around the revival on Broadway, I said, I, they called me in to uh, understudy Judy Ivey, who was playing Sally Plummer. And I didn't want to play Sally. I didn't want to understudy Sally. Although I came in I, and I did the lines, I read, I read the sides they gave me, I sang a Phyllis song, Could I Leave You? And I ended up getting cast as not only Phyllis, uh, as, as um, Phyllis, which was played by Blythe Danner, but also I covered Polly Bergen, who was uh, Carlotta. Who did I, I'm Still Here, and she did a great job I'm with that. Still Here, and, mm -hmm. and Marge Champion, who was Emily, and then Carol Woods, who was Stella. So I covered four roles, and I went on for all of them at any given time. And uh, Blythe had hurt her ankle. She was, she was actually visiting her daughter and left their daughter's uh, Gwyneth's uh, brownstone to get a uh, Starbucks or something and she twisted her ankle going down the stairs and it put her out of commission for a couple performances and uh, so I, I went on for her. Who were you that times. that happened? Huh? You finally got to, you got to go on? I finally got to go on. And What's with was, actors breaking their legs and falling? We were just talking to Brad Ask us how he got into the producers. Yeah, and, uh, I don't know. It you, does. But you can't really say break a leg to these actors anymore. It's a little dangerous, don't you think? Well, but you know, do you know what that that where that comes from? In the olden days, I'm going to show you. Uh, too bad the listeners can't watch this. But I'm. I'm <laughs> She's I'm, now standing up on there, right? There's one <laughs> foot behind me, and it's as if the the free musketeers would bow with their leg where they used to bow with their legs together and straight like this. But if their applaud applause kept going, they'd step back and bend the knee of the other leg, and that's the breaking of the leg. And people don't, you know, people don't know that. I always wonder. That's Thank the, you so much. for a huge ovation. It's for a huge ovation. There you go. Well, let's talk about Showboat a little bit because I saw you four times. Oh, Life Upon the Wicked Stage. There you go, yes. Life Upon the Wicked Stage. <laughs> How long did you play, Ellie? I did her for two years. Two years sort of my limit. I, I, two years of anything is, is good. I did Lily St. Regis for two years in Annie. And then I was going to ask you about that. And, and you sang Easy Street, right? I did. Can you sing a little bit of 20, Easy Street? The, remember the, it? the 11 o'clock number. Easy Street, Easy Street, where the rich folk play, where they play, play all day. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. And Gary Beach. I, oh, I can't say this on the radio, but I had I had more cocks on that stage than you could shake a stick at. I had, the, now that means that the, the character playing opposite me was Rooster, Rooster mm -hmm. Hannigan, of course, Miss Hannigan's brother. And I had, in the two years that I did that role, I had uh, 10 different Roosters. And I worked with Bob Fitch, who was the original, but when I first went into the show, it was Gary Beach. And we, you know, I didn't beaches. know that he is something. Gary Beach was a very funny person. man. Oh, and a lovely, lovely man. And I think he, he's kind of up there with Michael Servers. <laughs> it's just a professional, 
professional person, um, n not a, a mean bone in his body, uh, sweet, nice, supportive, talented, and uh, yeah, yeah, I just got, got to work with all these fabulous people. You're a lucky woman. Yes, I am very lucky. You know, he won the Tony for the, the producers. The producers. And uh, he played the director. Yes. Very strange director. Yes. Who had wonderful dresses, mm -hmm. I remember. He's a really nice man. He's from Virginia. So he's a I lo believe local yoga. That's right. I, I think okay. right. Well, let's talk about 42nd Street. Okay. Because you were a standby for Beth standby. Level, who just won the Tony for Drowsy Chaperone. Yes. Yes. It's actually, Beth was the uh, first standby for um, Christine Eversall and Mary Testa. And then when Christine, when Beth was on vacation, they brought me in to cover Christine. But then Christine left and Beth took over. And, uh, and the funny thing is that Beth replaced me in both the original 42nd Street as an E-Time Annie's and as Ellie in Showboat. So Beth and I just keep crisscrossing each other all the time and she's a divine woman. I, I adore her. Uh, and I in drowsy. I mean, she so deserved the Tony. She does. She's so I was funny. so happy. I well, was so happy when she won. She's such a wonderful person, and she's got such a great sense of humor. And she's you know she's paid her dues in this business, and and she it was just great to see her. Have, you, that have you seen Christine in Grey Gardens, which we're seeing in November twelfth? Unfortunately, I have not. You know, when we're doing shows, it's it's difficult when there when other shows are on the same schedule to see them. And then the last thing you want to do on your Monday night or Sunday night off is, is to go see another show. But the, I would have seen it. The, there was just not the opportunity. Well, you have another opportunity. It's, it's moving to the Walter Court. I, I understand that. As a matter of fact, they called me to come into audition to stand by for her in that. And with, after looking at 42 pages of material, I said, you know what? It actually, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to pass on the audition because I'm going to I'm going to arena stage to do cabaret because they conflicted. The two jobs would have conflicted anyway. Or maybe later. Who knows? You never if it's know. a big hit, which I'm praying for. It. It's a wonderful show. And talk about Madame uh, Renault, which you played in La Cage Faux with Gary Beach again. With Gary Beach. And uh, it's the first time I, I um, met Merwin Ford. And it was fun. That just It's an after. It's a post uh, script here. But uh, Merwin Ford and I went from a married couple in, in La Cage right into... The two standbys for for um, Sweeney, Todd. Sweeney Todd, yeah, which was which was fun. Madame Renault, it's a it's a small role. We're we're cafe owners. Evidently, the the role of of Renault was written for Walter Charles, in the original cabaret. So he tells me, and uh, and so we had these cafe owners, and we understudied again. I understudied Jacqueline and Madame Dandon, and Merwin understudied Mr. Uh, the Dandon himself. And I think that was it. I think he only covered uh, um, Dandon, but uh, it, it was it was fun. It was fun. Um, I was there. There I am an understudy with my own track, and then I did go on for for both the gals I covered. Well, there's well. a there's a, an experience where it won the Tony, unlike Sweeney Todd, and yes. three weeks later it was gone. Oh, right. how'd that happen? It's just so sad. You know, I don't understand it. We're there standing. We're there with audiences jumping to their feet every night. And the same thing with assassins. The same thing happened to assassins. Exactly, which was same thing was brilliant with you Raoul know, again. Yes, and and service. Service won the tone. Um, and I, I, I don't I don't understand it. You'd have to talk to the producers about that. The, that it's reason. been a strange. It's a strange uh, occupation, isn't it? You never know what's going to happen. You do. It's, you do not. Absolutely. Some great shows just don't make it, and some that shouldn't run so long do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Isn't that true? So talk about Spider Woman because you understudied, right? You weren't the standby. I, no, I was the standby. It's Be so confusing yes, sometimes. I know, I know. No, I was the standby because Cheetah, there were, was Cheetah. There were only three women in the show. Cheetah and the girlfriend and the, and, the, mother, and the mother, Marta. And uh, there were three of us that stood by in Toronto because we started out in Toronto and then we went to London and then we came to New York. And um, the unfortunately, the gal understudying uh, or standing by for the girlfriend's mother died. She had a uh, problem with the the family, of course, and so she wasn't able to go on to London and, and didn't come into New York with us. So I ended up standing by for both Cheetah and the girlfriend. I never went on for Cheetah. I went on for the girlfriend once in London. Um, because she had a tuna fish sandwich during between shows and it got food poisoning, so there you have that. And that's the other reason people go on. That's the reason I went on for Beth Level too in Forty Second Street. She got food poisoning. 
Um, you didn't plant that sandwich, did you? Not, I did not. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not like that. But again, Chita, uh, she was very gracious. Uh, we didn't, we weren't close personal friends. I mean, she had an assistant that was with her and went everywhere with her. She, she took really, really good care of herself. So, you know, she's never out partying or anything like I was. But <laughs> Well, you would never um, get on. It was like Elaine Stritch with Merman, right? And call me madam. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, she's from the old school. She's, she, she, Gwen Verdon, those gals from the old school. Beth is from the old school. Beth, Beth did, uh, really did not miss a lot. And the only times I really went on for Beth level was when she was on vacation. Uh, and then she did, she was ill that one time. But, um... She's a, a real, you know, they're, they're war horses. She's a trooper. And she is a trooper. And I feel the same way. I really, unless I, unless I can't walk or can't talk, I'm on that stage. Well, let's talk way back and talk about when you first decided you'd be an actress. Well, my mother uh, was a dancer and she was actually hired by Ziegfeld, uh, Ziegfeld when she was 17. And of course her parents wouldn't let her go. So I mean, otherwise I might not, not have been here today, but she was a dancer. And at the age of four, she put me into dance school. And I think vicariously uh, lived her life through me by watching, by watching all my success in, in the theater. But when I was four years old, she plopped me on this. I, I was uh, taking dance from a, a woman in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm originally from West Hartford. And Florence Greenland gave these huge dance recitals on the Bushnell stage and I, at the age of four I went out on that stage all by myself dressed in pink sequins and I sang oh you beautiful doll and I'm telling you that was the start of it just to be on the stage and I heard that applause and the one thing my teacher always used to say from the back of the house smile she'd be yelling <laughs> smile and then you learn you know through your teachers and everything try to hit you know hit the back of the house with your voice project and and then when I went to Carnegie Mellon, the head of the department just said, just get out there and, and sparkle. Larry Carraff, Larry Carraff from Long Island. Get sparkle. So, you know, it, that's what you do. You sing and you get out there and you, you sparkle. Well, it's been nice talking to you. And yeah, uh, I'm going to give you a chance here to sparkle again. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, and invite our listeners to come see Cabaret. Tell them why this production is so unique. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, 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 Molly has just gotten to the crux of it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not the raw Sam Mendes revival um, in the 90s, but she, because we were working off the 87 script, but I would say it is a, a raw look at that script. And to, to me, uh, Cabaret, actually to quote something that, uh, from Mark Bly's, uh, all the information he gave us, uh, our dramaturg, uh, it's a madcap retreat from reality. And I think that's what would happen if, if people come to see this show. They will leave reality for a while. And, of course, that's why we go to the theater, is to, to be transported to another time to see another what's happening in, in life in another period, perhaps. And I just think people will have a good time. They will see um, the, the, the grit and the dirt, and yet it's, it's a lot of fun at the same time. And I think Molly's just done a, a wonderful job at helping incorporate what's going on with the times now, which are very uncomfortable with our, our production of Cabaret. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Joel. It was I a wish great honor. another couple of days to, to discuss all this fun. <laughs> thank you very much. Good luck with the rest of the run. Thank you so much.